All right, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to our two o'clock briefing today. Mathematicians use new tools to spot and end gerrymandering. We have three speakers on our briefing today. They are Jonathan Mattingly, professor of mathematics and statistical science at Duke University. Matt Barreto, professor of political science and Chicano studies at the University of California, Los Angeles. And Moon Duchin, associate professor in the Department of Mathematics at Tufts University, where she's also a senior fellow in the College of Civic Life. So we'll get started now hearing from our speakers and then we'll open it up to Q&A. Thank you. All right, so uh, the US political system is based on balancing local representation with global effects. So here are three redistrictings. Two of them were actually used in North Carolina in the last decade. Gerrymandering is usually defined as manipulating those boundaries of districts to affect, to advantage one party. Implicit in that is the idea that you're affecting and changing the outcome from one, from what was known to another. That outcome is usually often taken in the popular press or social media to be proportional representation. But our system in no way was designed to produce proportional representation, which begs the question, if it wasn't designed to propor produce proportional representation, what would the outcome be for a given map with a given set of votes typically? So, or more, more importantly, if you had a certain set of votes, what would be the typical outcome if you had drawn non-partisan maps, ungerrymandered maps. And the approach my group has taken to that question is to look at a bunch of different maps, take those maps and compare them with a large number of other maps which help you understand when one map has unusual features or behaviors. The nonpartisan scientific question embedded in that statement is how do you generate this large number of maps? There's been a lot of work in trying to understand interesting ways to produce um, maps using Markov train Monte Carlo and other ideas around that. I'll talk about a number of advances in that in my, in my talk. Um, this method has proven to be particularly um, powerful or convincing in court. Um, it was one of the basis of the Common Cause versus Rucho case that went to the U.S. Supreme Court where it eventually was decided not that the facts were wrong but that the case was not one that the court was willing to take up. Then it returned to North Carolina and this fall in Three in two different court cases, all three of the maps typically used at the statewide level, the U.S. Congressional map and the two maps used in the state legislative assemblies were thrown out and we'll have new maps in 2002, largely based on three witnesses talking about this type of analysis. You not only get an insight into what is unusual, but you also get insight into things like cracking and packing and local specific geographical structures. Oh, there you go. I'm gonna send it over. All right, thank you, uh, Jonathan. Um, good afternoon. My name is Matt Barreto um, from UCLA. At this conference, I'll be presenting a paper with Dr. Lauren Collingwood, my co-author uh, from UC Riverside, where we look at how gerrymandering has been impacting uh, racial and ethnic minorities and the idea of the lack of representation and vote dilution. Um, Lauren and I have developed some new tools, some new statistical tools, some new uh, software packages that we think will aid in this. Um, so one of the uh, first things to um, think about is what do we mean about minority representation? Um, the Voting Rights Act of 1965 has provisions which ensure the protection of the minority vote. Um, specifically, the Voting Rights Act prohibits districting plans that use racial gerrymandering to dilute minority opportunities, opportunities to elect candidates. Um, the question is that detecting minority vote dilution can be quite difficult and requires a mix of political science data, census data, statistical analysis, and computer programming. Uh, and so Collingwood and I have developed a, a software package that we call EI Compare. This stands for Ecological Inference, EI. Uh, compare. Um, and this is used for voting rights analysts, redistricting specialists to obsess and ob to assess, not obsess, <coughs> Maybe. some of us are, uh, <laughs> to assess and observe racial voting patterns. Uh, we use precinct data, voter file data, and census data. 
So one of the first things I want to just demonstrate is that it can be quite difficult to understand whether or not you observe minority vote dilution and which estimates are the best. Uh, as Jonathan explained, oftentimes different statisticians, mathematicians, political scientists come in with a variety of different metrics. One of the things that our um, software package does is it combines those, it assesses across those, and it compares. And we're able to demonstrate whether or not there is consistency in those estimates or not. Through that, we create, uh, create uh, graphics and metrics like these uh, violin plots that show um, the consistency of the estimates, whether or not there are any outliers, to aid the analyst in looking for uh, minority vote dilution or gerrymandering and whether or not these estimates uh, are going to be consistent. Uh, we also provide a, um, a number of congruence, reliability statistics uh, to, to be able to easily and properly analyze whether or not there is minority vote dilution taking place uh, in these jurisdictions. One of the most important advancements that we think that we're incorporating is how to properly assess the race of voters when looking at issues of districting and minority vote dilution. Um, we're going to be building on in this uh, recent developments in what's called Bayesian Improved Surname Geocoding uh, by Elliott and his colleagues and more recently by two political scientists, Imai and Kana. Uh, in here, everyone's surname gets a probability for being black, white, Hispanic, Asian, or other. This comes from census data. This is all known from the US Census. They have all of our last names and what box we check on the race category. So these probabilities are well known and documented from the census. Uh, from there, we can incorporate someone like Jackson and look at what precinct, they, or excuse me, what census block they live in. The census uh, data tells us all the demographics of your neighbors, of your block. And if they lived in this particular block, which is very high density African American, and their name was Jackson, we might conclude they have a very high probability of this voter being African American. That will aid in understanding whether or not their vote is being diluted. However, if they lived in this other block just around the corner and this block was 80% white, we might concur that this person named Jackson with a 39% probably is actually white. So we're incorporating this Bayesian improved surname geocoding directly into our analysis of ecological inference. Um, and the final thing, just a couple of highlights, uh, we have many more different tools and metrics. Uh, that we've put into this software package. Uh, the final thing we want to highlight is that uh, given that we are in a Bayesian setting in conducting these analyses, uh, we direct users to use a probability framework rather than uh, confidence interval testing that a frequentist approach might result in. We direct users to use a, a Bayesian probability framework uh, that allows us to conclude what is the likelihood of different scenarios, whether we're looking at at district maps, whether we're looking at voting patterns, what is the likelihood or probability of that event occurring rather than that event occurred or it didn't occur and there's no gray area. And so here's just an example um, of a plot that we uh, create in our map that in our uh, uh, program that allows people to look at the overlap. Uh, finally, as we head into the 2021 redistricting, we hope that people are able to uh, build on uh, this work and, and our analysis in this paper to understand how when districts are being drawn to have a very particular eye towards racial vote dilution and how racial gerrymandering is affecting communities of color. Okay. All right, thanks. All right, so I'm, I'm really pleased to be here with, with both of these guys. And I'd like to talk a little bit about the work um, of my group. I run a redistricting lab that brings together statistics, math, computer science, geography, and other fields. Um, and we have a few different kinds of projects that I think are, are pretty no noteworthy. Um, and some of them build on some of what you've uh, been hearing about already. So first, something new that we haven't heard about yet. There's a frontier I'm really interested in, in voting rights, where math can make a, a pretty uh, important intervention, I think. And that is how we vote at all. So we have districts, we have plurality system. Um, so whoever has the most votes in the district wins. But especially at a local level, there's actually room to do something else. And what you're seeing now is a lot of interest in alternative models such as ranked choice voting, where when you go to vote, you don't just pick one person, but you take all the candidates and you try to put them in preference order so that your vote isn't wasted if you vote, end up voting for a more marginal candidate. The problem with ranked choice, it's extremely hard to model. Um, and even though it's taking off around the country, so uh, everywhere from Minneapolis to Memphis to the whole state of Maine now, 
Um, we don't have enough data on how people um, list their preferences to, to train sort of standard statistical models. So it takes some creativity, and you have to look both spatially and social choice statistically uh, to try to learn something new and make some predictions about ranked choice. Particularly, um, folks are coming to our group and asking us questions about the voting strength of communities of color. Um, ranked choice is thought to be really promising for getting better proportionality. And sometimes you hear about partisan gerrymandering, sometimes you hear about racial gerrymandering. Um, bless you. Um, part of the promise of ranked choice is that it can give you proportional outcomes on more than one axis at a time. Uh, so that's something that we're really interested in trying to understand and we're looking for new mathematical insight and in how that could play out. Secondly, we also like to think about ecological inference, which you just heard about from Matt. And we're making there a slightly different intervention, but I think the work will really build on, I'm very excited to actually get a chance to talk to Matt while we're here. Um, so the work can build on each other and synergize. And there I'll just be really brief and I'll say well, some of what we're doing with ecological inference is trying to take advantage of computational tools to move away from just really simple um, probability models with just a few parameters and try to, to harness the power of computation to, to look for much more complicated probability measures than the, the models from the 90s were built to accommodate. Um, and then last, I, I have up here a picture of the state of Pennsylvania, and it's being redistricted for you as we speak. <laughs> so you heard a little bit about court cases in North Carolina. Um, I was involved in the congressional redistricting case in Pennsylvania a few years ago, also a state Supreme Court case where the districts were thrown out and new districts were put in place and they were voted on. And, and just like in North Carolina, a lot of that evidence had to do with trying to understand what's the opposite of gerrymandering. The opposite of gerrymandering isn't necessarily fairness and justice and harmony. The opposite of gerrymandering is not gerrymandering. In other words, <laughs> if you can understand the universe of possibilities that's structured by the rules, then you can understand whether a map is a huge outlier in that universe or whether its properties are just dictated by the political geography of where people live and where they cluster. So there really have been some math breakthroughs in a few years coming out of multiple groups. Johnson's group at Duke, a group at uh, Carnegie Mellon and Pitt is doing really interesting work, and our group too. And we're bringing ideas from all over science and applied mathematics. So ideas from statistical physics, ideas from theoretical computer science, and we're really crystallizing around a science of map sampling uh, that we think is going to provide lots of useful guidance, not just in court, and I really want to emphasize that, but also for the commissions that are cropping up around the country um, and, you know, for redistricting bodies that are trying to redistrict well. It turns out to be a big, complicated problem, and math and computing can help. Great. Okay, thanks, everybody. So now we'll open the floor to questions. If you have a question, please raise your hand. We'll bring a mic to you and kindly state your name and affiliation before your question. And, and yep, we'll start here in the second row. Hi, um, my name is Meredith. I'm a freelance writer. Um, and this question is actually for Dr. Barreto. Um, when you were talking about your last name analysis and connecting that to the demographics, I was wondering why that would be necessary if you already had the census info on the demographics of the zones, if that makes sense? Yes. So. That's a great question. So the question was, uh, why are we uh, bothering with the looking at the surname and other census data when we already have the census data on the zones? The reason is that in order to understand voting patterns, we don't want to look at the overall uh, census because the census, even when we restrict it to citizen voting age adults, is all eligible voters. And in many elections, our voter turnout is very low. So what the surname geocoding analysis does is it uses the voter file as the input. So we start with, which is publicly available, so we start with the first thing that our uh, software does is it reads in the voter file. And so it has your name, your last name, your address, and that you're a voter. So I take, I'm taking a step out, which is inferring voter turnout rates. Um, I'm then using your surname to learn something about you, and then I'm also using the census data um, your neighborhood data to learn something else about you, and then that gives me a pretty reliable estimate of the race and ethnicity of all the actual voters. So we're tasked with telling uh, courts um, or commissions how are blacks uh, voting, how are Latinos voting, how are whites voting? Are they preferring the same candidates? Are they preferring different candidates? Will this district mapping scheme work, uh, or will this create more problems? And so um, 
rather than using census data, which is at a higher level, either total population, voting age population, or even citizen voting age population, we're trying to hone in straight down to the actual voters on the voter file itself. Question here in the back, and then we'll come over here. So Andre Master from Penn State. Obviously, I'm in Pennsylvania. I think this is for Jonathan. Anybody who looked at the map of Pennsylvania would have to say that it was gerrymandered. I mean, it was sort of amazing. But in your maps, how much differences are on all of those maps that you're generating? And what do you use to generate them? I mean, it's obviously population and space, but how exactly are you doing it to get the different versions? So let me answer, you asked if I get it right, two questions in a way. You kind of alluded in some ways to the eyeball test. Like you looked at it, I, you know, you know gerrymandering when you see it. But let me, so I, I, I got a little worried about time. So I rushed over these two, three slides here. So the, uh, you know, if you were in Sesame Street, you might play which of these ones is not like the other. <laughs> and uh, according to your eyeball test, I think you would agree that the bottom two are the same. Well, relatively, which is the bot are the bottom two more like than the top than they are to the top one, or yeah? Well, I mean, you're you're, you're I mean, of course, I'm setting you up. Whenever somebody does that, you know that they're setting you up. So, so, so you should be aware. And you're right. The top two are the same. The top two are politically identical. And so, the top two were the actual maps used in the last decade in North Carolina, and the bottom one was another map drawn up by some nonpartisan group or bipartisan group. And so, you know, that's, that's part of the answer. And, oops, oops, what just happened? There we go. So, and so here's a little movie we, we made, which I didn't get to show, so I started running out of time. But when you can actually use these kind of maps and create, first thing to notice is that just over a whole collection of maps, you can have a huge, that whole blue histogram, you can have a huge di um, diversity in the outcome with one set of votes. The votes are staying the same. So that should first, you know, warn you. And none of those maps look that strange. Some, I mean, a lot of those maps don't look strange. So you can find maps that don't look strange, that are just as gerrymandered as the ones that look strange. So I'd really, mm -hmm. I would really caution against looking at a map and deciding it looks Pennsylvania. Well, that's right, but I mean, that's because you know, you, you something happened. I mean, somebody didn't care to hide it. But if they care to hide it, they can create one just as gerrymandered in many cases. So I, I was so okay. So the next question was, how do we generate? I'll be really quick because I took too long on the first answer. Um, the same thing that Moon was just doing with that, the maps blinking around. We use similar types of techniques. A whole, the whole group, the community uses a number of different ones. And we're running something called a Markov chain Monte Carlo algorithm to walk randomly through the space of all possible redistrictings that are reasonable. And that's part of the question, right? What is reasonable? So we set up some nonpartisan criteria, and that's open for discussion. That's a public policy question. I mean, we want to inform that conversation by showing what happens if you make certain choices, but once you make those choices, then you can ask, what's the map? Maybe Moon wants to add something. Yeah, actually, why don't I follow up with some Pennsylvania-specific agreement? So what happened in Pennsylvania was, you know, there's that notorious map from 2011 where the seventh district outside Philly is called Goofy Kicking Donald Duck mm -hmm. because it looks like, you know, you see these cartoon characters dancing around. But what happened was, after that map was, was thrown out, so there's a little more scrutiny on what the shapes would look like, the, um, the, the, the same legislative caucus put forward a new map. Um, in fact, they, they didn't pass it as a bill, which would have been the standard process, but they floated it on Twitter, so I call it the Twitter map. Mm -hmm. um, and that was a replacement map, which just like you heard in North Carolina, looked pretty and acted the same, right? So the eyeball test has only been a good reliable aid while people weren't under scrutiny for the shapes, right? But it turns out, I've spent now, you know, I'm a geometer and I've spent now a couple of years really thinking about, is there something we can say about the shapes of the districts that would prevent the worst abuses? And I've come to the conclusion that shapes just aren't constraining. Yeah. If you tell me I gotta make pretty shapes, I can still do bad things with pretty shapes. So that's why we really need forensics that kind of get under the surface and try to understand how the maps, how the lines were really made. I think we had a question over here, and then we can come back up. Robert Frederick, American scientist in uh, Research Triangle Park, North Carolina. Um, other than ranked choice voting as a mathematical problem still to solve, it sounds like most of the math is already pretty well established with things like the ham sandwich theorem and 
like that. So is it mostly just a, well, for the, yeah, for the non-ranked choice voting. Uh, so is it mostly just a political decision at this point? So I'm just going to contest. I'm going to say the math of redistricting is so hard. Um, so the, the work that we're doing here, this kind of map sampling, is right at the research frontier. Um, I think when I started thinking hard about redistricting, so I started working on this pretty full time in 2016, and at that point I thought, oh, this, is, this must be settled math. In fact, I thought, I'll just find the best book on it and teach it. And then the more I got into it, the more I was like, wait a second. Uh, this whole area could really use some more uh, research level math. Uh, thankfully, there are people already working really hard on that. Um, but I think it's, it's, it's not true uh, in the first place that, that the theorems like the ham sandwich theorem apply to this. You know, you see in this picture all the little pieces. Some of what's so hard about redistricting is that you're not just drawing lines on an Etch-a-Sketch. You actually have pieces that you're trying to respect. You have community structure that matters. You have, you know, you have cities whose boundaries you'd like to try to respect. You have pieces, you have precinct, you have census, geography. Um, and that makes it a dizzyingly hard combinatorial problem. Um, so I don't think that, I love the ham sandwich theorem as much as the next guy. I don't think it gets you very far in real world redistricting. And also maybe you should add, I mean, right out of Moon's playbook in a way that, that all the rate choice voting theory is usually kind of in a homogeneous, it has no spatial structure in it. Mm -hmm. It doesn't take into the fact that the Chiquinos live in one mm -hmm. place, you know, this part of suburbia is this way, this part of suburbia is that way, right? It, mm -hmm. it doesn't take that into it account. Doesn't know that. Yeah. It doesn't know that. And so that the effect of that on the effectiveness of a rate choice voting scheme is much, much more complicated, which is what Moon's alluding to, I think, partially. I just had one comment from the sort of uh, political uh, perspective and someone who's worked on redistricting commissions, that these maps and models that mathematics can give us greatly improve the ability um, to put then before commissions this range of opportunities that perhaps wasn't there before. Before it really was people looking at a, a county or sub-county and drawing and saying, I want this, I want that, and making, and this allows us to constrain what they can do in terms of the bad stuff and open up opportunities to say, well, you wanna try to do it in a neutral way, but then you still have to have um, some sort of on-the-ground observer or someone uh, politically astute to then say, well, we do need that little, that little finger. They're called fingers, right, that come out on the maps. We, we need that because that community is connected to this community and we have to balance the population and things like that. But these are tremendous improvements for redistricting commissions. I was the uh, expert on the California Independent Commission in 2011, and um, much of the stuff, as Moon and Jonathan have talked about, have been developed since then. These are brand new, and so I'm very hopeful that in, in 2021 that these will be in front of many of the commissions. Tom Keenan from Business Edge. A few years ago, I actually did a study. I downloaded from openphilly.com a lot of uh, voting information because you have this wonderful law that people have to give an address. I found out a remarkable thing. One of them was that there were hundreds of people. I was also doing surname analysis. Hundreds of people with names like Smith, Johnson, and so on who all lived at the same address. So I figured it must be the biggest boarding house in the world. I checked it, it turned out to be the office of the Electrical Workers Union. So you can kind of imagine what happened. People walked in and they were told, hey, register, vote for our guy and make a contribution. And by the way, you can use our address. So how reliable do you actually think that election date is, given that I, I can show you my paper where a lot of it was actually the people living in the same place? I don't have too much to say about uh, union uh, <laughs> shenanigans and politics. Um, I think probably we all have examples from you know New York, Chicago, and any number of places. Um, the voter file itself, which is another thing that underlies a lot of this uh, data, the voter file it's, itself is getting theoretically more and more accurate as we are um, you know able to cross-check that against other pieces of data. Um, there, most states have requirements that the voter file needs to be up to date, maintained. Um, if anything, my concern uh, from a political social science perspective is that an over, um, an over interest in, in cleaning or scraping, the, uh, updating the data leads to some people getting thrown off of the voter file. Um, some states have pretty strict measures that if you skipped two elections, you can get taken off the voter file even if you've never moved or anything like that. So, but most states have pretty um, 
simple. This came out of the um, uh, NVRA and the Help America Vote Acts that all came after the infamous 2000 presidential election. Um, but most of them now have, have rules about having the voter files much more up to date and clean. They're still not perfect, but they are getting better. And the better that data gets, the better then we can feed it into any number of these different things when we need to subdivide the population and understand how those election outcomes would, would come up. But I wouldn't be surprised about um, say, those shenanigans. Right, right. The voter file where you're registered to vote uh, should be uh, pretty accurate, and then you're assigned to the precinct in your community. Just to understand a little bit more about the, the ranked uh, choice, Moon, you talked about one of the, the problems being proportional outcomes on more than one access at one time. What does that mean? Yeah. Sure. So if you compare the way we vote in the U.S. to, say, most of Western Europe, um, they have what's called a proportional system of voting, um, which is accomplished in most places with something called party list voting. So when I go to vote for the French legislature, I don't vote for a person. I actually vote for a party. And then the party gets a number of seats proportional to how much vote support it had. It's called party list because the party has a list of names, and then they can go however deep in that list they need to to get, you know. And so you've got proportionality by design, right? But that's what I would call on only one axis, and that axis is party. Um, in France, the government doesn't like to talk about race. There's actually a law. The government can't ask you your race in France. It's very different from how the census collects data uh, here in the U.S. Um, but in the U.S., um, we care very much about representation for minority communities as well. And so that means we want to think about being representative on the axis of race as well as the axis of party. Do you see what I mean by that? And so the thing about ranked choice is, it's, um, in principle, it's giving you proportionality even on axes you didn't know to think about. The environmentalists, um, if there are enough votes for environmental candidates, they'll get proportional representation and so on. So the thing about ranked choice is that you can have complicated factors that go into your preferences, but since your votes transfer um, from one to the next, those all get reflected uh, in some way in the process in the end. And what we're exactly trying to model is that's the theory. How well does it do in practice um, at, at living up to that promise of proportionality? And also the French system lacks kind of geographical. Right? I mean, the representatives aren't always from the right area. Oh, yeah, super complicated. And that's Let's super talk more about French. Yeah, that's, 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 that's super complicated, right? So that's, I mean, that's a real American tradition mm -hmm. that, that makes everything complicated, right? The local, the locality of our representatives. Mm -hmm. Questions? Stay in the back. Okay. Yeah, I'm Mari Jensen. I live in Tucson, Arizona. Um, I'm a little confused, Dr. Barreto, about the the information that you get from the voter files, are these people who actually voted in a particular election or just people who are registered? Uh, theoretically, you could use this uh, method that we described on either one of those, but these uh, here in this case, um, we would be using it for people who actually voted. Um, so the people who voted in an election, um, it's either called the sign-in data, because you have to sign in when you vote, or you can get it after the fact and just called vote history and say, give me all the people who voted in the city council or the presidential election. Okay, so which one do you use, the city council or the presidential? Uh, it depends on what you're trying to do. So this, in this example that uh, I gave uh, here came from a local election, uh, and we were trying to understand whether or not there were racial and ethnic voting patterns in a local election. And so rather than using the census data, which would have been for uh, a large number of people, say 100,000, um, there was only maybe 25,000 votes cast. Uh, and so we wanted to restrict the analysis to understand whether or not there was minority vote dilution. So we just got the local election results, inputted those into our program, identified the surname and the neighborhood, and it allowed us to understand uh, voting patterns by race and ethnicity. If you were doing it for a statewide redistricting commission, they might want to say, will this district perform? Will it elect um, representatives from that community they would probably be looking at congressional elections or state legislative elections. And so whatever the election was, you could feed in the voter file data from that election. So and you might have different results. If there was very low minority turnout in a local election, but very high minority turnout, one district might appear to be more white or more minority, depending on the turnout levels. Yeah, no, that, that was one of the reasons I asked the question about which do you choose. And then the other thing is, maybe I'm wrong about this, that – 
that making these maps on a state by state basis in the states, you know, are in charge of making their own maps, so far as I understand. Um, but they're making these maps for prospective reasons, not retrospective reasons. So what's made in 2021 is going to govern for, you know, ten years, ten years, ten, ten, ten no. years. and then you have all kinds of changes that. But that's why I was curious about which. Um, which data you use? So that's a really interesting question. I think everyone probably has a thought about this. Um, we try to use the most relevant to the election. But your last comment is a really important one, and one for us to think about theoretically, all of us from our different perspectives, because right now we're at the end of the redistricting. So we're looking at districts that are overpopulated, underpopulated, that are now very heavily minority, but have had white uh, representatives, or vice versa in places of gentrification. and. Um, we don't do a good job of thinking how those populations might change by the end of the decade um, and what that means or what considerations we might need. Uh, typically, redistricting commissions look at what is the population in 2020 and how can we divide that population in 2020 um, so that we don't have more than 10 percent deviation. Um, but certainly, in the United States today, there's a lot of movement, and I don't know how the maps are taking that into account. Courts haven't really told us to look forward 10 years, but it's a very critical question. Yeah, there, there's just like, it's really complicated in the case law, but there's another tool that, that we all use all the time that's an important one to keep in mind. So in the, just a little bit before 2010, the, the Census Bureau started releasing another product um, in, in five-year uh, rolling averages called the American Community Survey, or ACS. And so that's a much more detailed, in fact, my house happened to be an ACS household this time around. So I got to answer the questions. I got some insight into, uh, into some of that. So it's a much more detailed set of questions to a smaller sample of people. And it's used to give you a sense of how much those numbers have drifted in between the 10-year increments. You'll see it used in a lot of court cases. And there are a few where, because it has, it has some higher margins of error because it's done based on a sample. So there are a few cases where judges have pushed back on the, the tension between ACS data and census data, but it's really an indispensable tool of the trade for trying to answer exactly that question. That, that legal fiction that the census put in place in the year ending with zero, um, how far off are we from that what, by, by the time we're Sure. Sure. Well, but Pennsylvania re-redistricting happened in 2018. Or if there's lawsuits. So typically what happens, right, is we'll come out with our maps in 2021, and then there's going to be probably for five years through mid-decade, lots of lawsuits challenging those. If your lawsuit finally goes forward in 2024, to Moon's point, you want to be using the 2024 census data, which now exists, and it didn't used to in, in the past. And, and let me kind of turn this perspective around a little bit. I mean, maybe our point of view... The, but everything they said, I agree with, and it's it's one of the things, one of the sets of questions we should be asking. But another set of question we're asking is, is this map a good map? And so there, you may want to use lot every one of the every different election you have, and even different mm -hmm. synthetic ones you create, mm -hmm. are just different microscopes to look at that map. And so it's not necessarily saying that I'm going to do this map and I'm going to predict what's going to happen in the next election. That's not the game I'm in. I'm not trying to predict the future. What I'm trying to tell you is under a bunch of reasonable possible scenarios, does this map perform in a way that we would all be okay with, that we'd all be comfortable with? And mm -hmm. so that's, so in that sense, all of these different maps, and all these different sets of voting data are would, better. Are, yeah, have, have some, they're just different, they're different magnifying glasses to look mm -hmm. at this map with. That's a great point. Okay, question here. Um, this is for Matt. I'm, I'm curious, um, given that some last names are less uh, identifiable with a particular group, and there are areas that are, well, fewer now, but there are integrated areas that have more balance. What's your margin of error for um, those, those kinds of situations? Um, so the um, BISG uh, function um, does provide um, you know, these probability estimates. And it does, it'll give you a probability of being each of the four major racial ethnic groups or other. And we should be careful not to try to assign you, based on your name and surname, a specific uh, race, but rather take the 1,000 people in your precinct and aggregate those. So that's the first answer. Um, the second to the very last point you made is that uh, residential segregation is much worse than it was in the 60s. 
Uh, from a data perspective of trying to use your neighborhood to understand your race, that's good. Uh, from a social perspective, that's of course terrible. <laughs> um, and so that means that the, the data are, are quite discriminating. Um, so there are certainly lots of uh, pockets that are more integrated, um, but we kind of want some of those in the data so that it helps us understand uh, the tales and that we do have that um, variation across the minimum to maximum, but there's very high intense residential segregation. We're using block data, and block data is really low. So if you imagine large cities like uh, Seattle or New York, there might be diverse areas, but there might be major intersections that really divide heavily, and we see that when we go down to the block level. So the block level data uh, really does provide a, um, a, a lot of information. Um, and the way that, uh, say very briefly, the way the surname analysis works is that uh, for highly occurring Hispanic surnames, um, they have very high probability scores. Um, and so those usually do a pretty good job. Um, and they don't overlap often with other racial or ethnic groups. Like Filipinos. Uh, except for Filipinos, and there are places like Daly City, uh, California, just down the coast, which has a very large Filipino and Mexican American population. So that's a place where you would need uh, the census data, because the census data might say this neighborhood is very high density uh, Latino and this one is very high density Asian, and that would help us look at Martinez, which is a common occurring Filipino surname. Um, white and black surnames are um, the most likely to overlap. Uh, and so in the example I had Jackson, those estimates were about right. It's about 39% white and 53% black. And that's why we would also need to know, well, what neighborhood do you live in? And so once I see your neighborhood demographics and your name, uh, these have been validated against self-reported data. So places where people did check their race on the mark and um, they usually perform really, really accurately. Um, and so it's a very helpful helpful tool for us to feed that into our districting analyses and, and racial polarized voting analyses to understand how people are voting. We had a question over here. And Robert Frederick, American Scientist. Forgetting for a moment the political infeasibility of compulsory voting <laughs> in the United States, what problems go away with gerrymandering and which ones remain? We have uh, at least one Australian here in the audience. <laughs> <laughs> Who wants to start? So, so it's just to understand the question. So you're saying that if we forced everyone to vote, then how much of this is turnout questions? Is that kind of your... Oh, definitely. Yeah, I think any vote, whether you discount by who votes or who doesn't vote, I don't it think it worse. changes things. Yeah. With compulsory voting, it gets worse because it gives you greater knowledge of who will vote and so a greater ability to precision engineer your districts, right? But, but to answer the other question that almost sounds like the one you asked, what if you could solve gerrymandering, <laughs> right? Then uh, how much change does that make? Um, well, if, one thing I would say about that question is that um, you know people disagree about the magnitude of the effect in terms of partisan composition of, of Congress. But, but one thing is that I think a lot about is just sort of faith in the system. Um, so this is something that legal scholars have sometimes called the expressive harms of ugly districts. You were talking about <laughs> Pennsylvania, and you look at the plan and you say, well, the people who drew that plan aren't really thinking about my interests. Right, so that's uh, what some people have called expressive harms, and I think you know some kind of renewed faith in in the system uh, is is a healthy outcome of of at least people's feeling that that gerrymandering is abating. And also in the same way, I mean, I think one thing. So I, I was trying to go back to a slide that I kind of zipped over, but one one thing that I, that that we talked about in the court cases was this type of this polarization, like we have districts that are packed and districts mm -hmm. that are cracked, and if it leads to that, right, then you have a whole bunch of districts, I mean, I, I don't necessarily agree with the idea that you should go for lots of competitive districts because competitive under which election, under a Clinton election, under a Bush election, or, you know, which elections. But having a succession of districts that kind of flip as a political, every time there's a swing in political opinion, one flips. I think that's what we lose in some of these gerrymandering things and leads to exactly what Moon's saying. It compounds this loss of faith in the system, right? It doesn't matter. I, my district will never flip. No, none of the districts in the state will ever flip. So therefore, you know, if you baked in the result ahead of time, how is Congress relevant to you? One of the things I often uh, think about when we think of, like, what is gerrymandering and do we know that it exists is 
theoretically, people think it's this idea of a mismatch between some sort of aggregate vote total and then what the district composition looks like. And oftentimes, um, liberals will point to uh, places where they may have won the statewide vote, uh, and I'll put myself in the category of liberals, except for the complaining about part, because I'll give a rejoinder. But in places like Wisconsin or other places where they say, well, we won 52% of the vote in the statewide election, but we only have 34% of the seats. There must be some sort of mismatch. And from my perspective as a political scientist, it's not that simple because you do have to draw around communities of interest and other sorts of principles, and we don't have proportional representation. And I typically respond that, you know, in the state of California, uh, where I live, um, you know, uh, Democrats do well. They win about 60% of the, of the statewide popular vote. But right now, we have 46 of 53 House seats. So that's like... And then I live in Massachusetts. 90%. <laughs> so, and our seats are drawn by an independent commission. Independent commission of an equal number of Republicans and Democrats. And it's because we have a lot of these very uh, competitive districts, and Democrats win a lot of them by about 5 or 7%. And so... When we draw the, so it's not quite as simple as saying, well, is California gerrymandered? Like, how do Democrats have 90% of the House seats, but only 60% of the vote? And so we need to get down and look at the community level. The, the techniques and the mapping tools and the math that Jonathan and Moon are talking about are instrumental in that, but it's that high level sort of critique is one I often hear and say, yeah, I mean, Wisconsin probably does have problems. <laughs> But um, it's not as simple as saying, wait a minute, we got 52% of the vote, but we don't have 52% of the seats. It's just a fact that if you think of it like a map from votes to outcomes of elections, our voting system favors parties that are spread out more mm -hmm. geometric mm -hmm. geographically than mm -hmm. that has. I mean, it's just it's mm -hmm. built in. You could say that's a bias. No, it's actually just a feature of our system. If you don't like it, you should change the system. But if that's our system, then sometimes that is the right outcome. And that's kind of the question we're trying to answer. We're trying to say, let's not fall back on the crutch mm -hmm. of, of invoking proportionality as that's our, that, when, when he said that, everyone in the audience went, oh, and I was like, no, don't, didn't you hear what I said? No, 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 it's not proportionality. You have right. to look at what the geography of that state is and where the people live and what that implies. Some of the times we've looked at Wisconsin, that's what came out was exactly right, even though it's counterintuitive, right. if you are primed to think proportionality. Question here. I think we have time for this last one. Yeah, I, I hope this isn't too much of a non sequitur, but um, how would you apply those arguments maybe to like the national level, like say the Electoral College, which is sort of very similar where people will often complain that, uh, for example, in the 2016 election, Hillary Clinton and the popular vote. And mm -hmm. does any of this apply on that level as well? Well, I mean, I, one, one way into that question is is to, to build on, on some of these other ideas, you know, there's this whole kind of math or economics called social choice theory, which says the system has consequences. And um, the electoral college system definitely has consequences that are different from what would happen if you went to a popular vote. But there are also theorems that say no system has all the properties that you want, <laughs> right? And so I think there's a really interesting moment to look uh, systemically at the way we do different levels of election in the country and to think about changing the rules to comport better with the ideals that we want to have in place. If proportionality is a goal, um, we should write it into the rules, right? Um, and there are, I think, opportunities to do that because you know, in 2018 alone, five states put to the voters um, a question about whether redistricting should be reformed. And all five states, and you know, that includes Utah and Colorado, Missouri, uh, Ohio, in Michigan, um, all, all five states passed redistricting reform. And in some cases, they did it and they changed the rules at the same time. So to better comport with sort of a deliberative democracy notion of what people were looking for from the system. So I think that's also uh, an important perspective to have here is that the rules entail some structural properties. And if you're not happy with those, the rules can be changed. I mean, that's a, a, a kind of corollary of the fact that we leave the, the system of election to the states. That means we have laboratories of democracy and we can try different sets of rules in different states and see if they're getting us closer to our ideal of representative democracy.
Thank you all. That was very good and very good math and very good maps too. Yeah. <laughs> okay. If you may have additional questions for the speakers, there will be a follow-up room, room 208 across the hall. You can go there and talk to them. Thank you again for your time. Thank you. Thank you.